Hello, welcome to our uh, Commodity Deconstruction Optimization webinar here that we're, we're having today. Um, this is Austin Data Labs, and uh, my name is Dave Brown. Um, I just want to give you a little um, intro to who I am. Um, I'm the Chief Industry Officer here at Austin Data Labs, and part of that uh, is the fact that I spent most of my career uh, prior to coming here. Um, and, and, and helping to found this company in the American meat industry, um, particularly pork. Um, and in that time, I spent um, pretty much all of that time in the uh, business side of it. So scheduling, product management, sales pricing, all of that good stuff. Um, and then, you know, noticing that there were things that could be done better uh, helped to start this company. And that's, uh, that's how this all got started. Another industry that we work on here is dairy, and um, you know, for that, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague Robbie. He's uh, he's an expert in that regard. So go ahead, Robbie. Uh, thanks, Dave. I, I think you're too kind uh, with, with the expert, <laughs> but I know a thing or two. Um, so um, I'm Austin Data Labs uh, director of dairy optimization. Um, I've been with um, ADL for coming up to two years now. Prior to that, I worked. Um, <laughs> in a range uh, of positions across uh, the dairy supply chain from uh, manufacturing through to more the financial side. Um, and I'd like to introduce my colleague Celso. Hello, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Celso Batista. I'm leading services for, for Austin Data Labs. I have a, a, a big background uh, from the business side working with, uh, with beef and in strategic planning and SNOP fronts. Uh, then I have I have a couple of years under my belt with with poultry and pork in a different company. So I touched some of the, the, the those proteins, the, the, the big ones. And now as a consultant I, I could emerge into this this dairy world as well. So there are there are lots of parallels that we will bring up in this in this discussion. Back to you Dave. Excellent. All right, so uh, for this next part, I, I'd like to, to just do a quick synopsis of what we think the term commodity deconstruction optimization means. It's not a common term in the industry. It's something that we've kind of created because we're talking um, about lots of different industries that all are very, very similar. And, and that's kind of, um, you know, an overriding uh, aspect of this conversation we're having today is that a lot of industries that think they're very unique, you know, uh, like, you know, the pork industry, when I was there, it was, you know, it was like, nothing's like the pork industry. You find that, that that's actually not completely true. There's, there's massive differences between the industries, but there are some very, very similar overarching uh, concepts here. And the big part of it is, is that you're starting with a commodity that you're then going to take apart and you're going to turn into smaller pieces. The other part of that that, that makes it um, you know, very similar but challenging is that when you make those choices to, for instance, let's say you're going to uh, sell liquid milk, you can now sell, you can't sell cottage cheese or butter or any of those, you, you've made the decision to sell all of the products that would make those other products. Vice versa, if you were going to say for sell, for instance, a boneless loin out of a, out of a hog, you would now have to sell tenderloins and rib ends and, you know, and boneless sirloins or, or bone and ham ends, whatever might come off of that as a byproduct. And this is the defining factor is this supply variability that then creates byproducts that you then have to sell whenever you make a choice. And you have demand variability that's often seasonal um, as well as, you know, variable between days and all of this kind of thing. So when you, you think about the supply variability, you know that you know, all the raw materials have variable characteristics. That's, that's the first thing. Secondly, um, forecasting what you're going to be able to produce is extremely challenging. Um, and you know, it comes back to the fact that you have this variability between whether it's animals or whatever the commodity is, like milk. Um, but there's there's this variability between days and between seasons, all of that. Then you have um, 
the more types of supply that you create. So think of, you know, like organic or commodity or, or gap, those kinds of different types of raw material supply. The more of those that you get, the more exponential the problem becomes. Because you basically have, you know, every time you create a new brand or a new uh, supply type, you're doubling the options as long as you're, you're, you're leaving all of your options open in each of those supply types. And then finally, choosing to make one item, like I mentioned before, has downstream effects and they're, they're massive downstream effects sometimes. It's not just like, oh, I, I'm, I choose this and I get one other thing. Sometimes like, you know, back to the boneless loin example, if you make a boneless loin, you can get seven, eight, ten different byproducts that you were, weren't going to have if you sell the bone in loin. So that's the supply variability. Um, so, you know, from the perspective of the supply issues, Robbie, what, what do you see in, you know, the global milk world and, and around that? Um, yeah, great, great question, Dave. So holistically, milk supply is very, very variable, both in terms of the quantity that can arrive each day at the plant but also in terms of the composition below that. So you have two problems going on here. The first is that when you, de you know, like as, Dad, as Dave said, when you're deconstructing, you start with a hole and you break it into its parts. But every time you break it down, you effectively constrain yourself further and further and further. And if things change, you're stuck with the decisions you've already made. So you can't respond. So you have that problem holistically, but you tie that then with the variability in the milk that is arriving at the factory, be it both in terms of quantity and composition, and you have a variable input that has to meet specified outputs at specified levels, and balancing these two equations is something that you know, firms have to get right, otherwise they're gonna leave value on the table. So a big challenge in the dairy industry is one, how much milk is there going to be on the day because that changes throughout the year? And two, will that milk be very watery for lack of a better term? Will it be low in fat, low in protein? Will it be high in fat, high in protein? Given how that can swing, how that can vary, how does that affect me hitting my production targets? If I need to make 100 tonnes of butter today, the amount of milk, the amount of cream required to do that will be very different today in October versus, to, you know, in May, let's say. So the big issue is how much of the stuff is there going to be and of what composition and then trying to balance that against um, our targets. Um, Celso, what, what sort of challenges do you uh, see in more the poultry um, and uh, flesh protein side? That is, the, the, there are lots of parallels in what you you, you just said, Robbie. Uh, in in the in the, the meat industry here in the South South America side, uh, we usually joke: we are buying a bull, a cow, or whatever we can get. So it's it's even hard hard to predict at that level. Uh, and to do a good planning, to get a, a a good process around around your everything that you 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 are flowing through your IBP cycle or SNOP cycle. Uh, it's important to predict the quality of your supply so you can take decisions of what which finished goods you can go after uh, and it's it's tough to predict even the number of animals you are you are purchasing on a daily level uh, because of the size in, in Brazilian case the size of the country uh, the weather is uh, plays a, a gigantic a huge factor in it if it's a if it's raining if it's not uh, you brought seasonality. If you you are getting a, a grass-fed animal or you, a, a grain-fed animal, you can see difference in, in this this quality you get from the, the the finished animal and how it's going to translate to the to the, the finished goods you can you can fulfill. And to Dave's point, you go after some qualities for specific cuts, but you need to deal with the whole animal. So you are going for round cuts, uh, specific pattern of, of quality and you have to deal with the, the 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 rest of the animal what you do with the four quarter what you do with with uh, ribs so it's it's really interesting how to to mix and match this this disassembly process you will get the full animal 
that's not a question. You will get it. You need to deal with it. So that's that's what is unique about those those segments we we, we are discussing. Uh, what can you bring, Dave, around around the U.S. side of this this problem? Yeah, I, you know, I think the number one thing that I would that I would talk about here is the fact that we all know that at least in you know you know pork and you know most beef in the United States, we're not dealing with the the grass cycle, um, you know, in the U.S. Um, the, that grass cycle has kind of been superseded by you know stockyards, um, you know, or, or I should say feedlots. Or um, you know, in, in the in the uh, pork world, you know, um, housing. So we basically don't have that variability that you see that extreme variability where you're almost shutting plants down for two or three months a year that you see elsewhere. But we see variability. You know, whenever we start getting new crop corn, for instance, you're going to see animals grow very quickly in in the fall and winter, and we get very heavy weights and this is a big deal in the pork industry uh, for sure because you will you know you'll be selling for instance say 1720s and 2023s all summer these are hams uh weight ranges for hams and then as you get into the fall when everybody wants those weight ranges that's when you don't have them because the hogs get huge um and you know you'll see the same thing um in in uh, in cattle when they get in you know get into uh, that same new crop corn as well um, so basically we see variability that is within weight ranges a lot we'll see variabilities within seasons in terms of you know total animal weight um, but we don't have that grass curve but the, even with those uh, smaller changes in supply it's still you know like particularly for me when I was, you know, running the, the, the scheduling and, and the product management world at Smithfield, you know, we were doing 120 to 130,000 head a day of, of hogs. And you make a couple percent change on that and, and you can really affect fill rates, you know, a couple percent change on what you're getting on, on or versus what you expect. So that variability can, can still be quite challenging there. So, um, so I think that's a, the biggest difference there. Um, so let's let's switch gears a little bit. We've talked about supply now for a while. Let's switch gears and let's talk about the demand side. Um, so, you know, when I was thinking about this a little bit, I, I, I came up with, you know, roughly four kinds of demand. And, you know, you could you could turn this into 100 kinds of demand if you wanted to to, uh, you know, get nitpicky about it. But the four basic types of demand that we see um, is that you have uniform demand. So this is, you know, the customers that just buy the same amount of product from you, the same codes, um, you know, most of the time, if not every week, at least, you know, 75% of the time. That's very uniform demand. That's what you build your business around. We all want that demand. Um, secondly, you have spot demand. Now, you know, this is, this is the negotiation stuff. You know, you've got an extra load. Somebody wants an extra load. You figure out the price and you move on down the road. The third one is um, the longer term contractual demand. Now, you could say that there's, you know, he threw a Venn diagram over the first one I talked about of, of long term run rate uniform demand versus contractual. It's probably heavily, you know, over top of each other. However, there is some differences here. Um, you know, because contractual demand could be, you know, frozen, it could be, you know, anything um, that, you've just done a long-term deal on. And then the final piece is frozen, dried, um, essentially longer shelf life type product. Um, and, you know, that you could even include uh, if you've got a processing kitchen that you're, you're pushing your product to, um, you know, so maybe your company makes bacon, um, you're sending all your bellies there. That's, you know, that's kind of in this same category of, you've you've got a lot of demand out front that you've got to fill between now and then but you have um you know what's coming so those are the the kind of the 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 four kinds of demand do you see any different ones Celso, or is it pretty much the same uh in in south america and, and the rest of the the south it is it is the same it's it's, it's really it's really uh, like the, the the big the big channels are the same I think what makes South America unique 
is the number of customers you need to address to have a, a successful business. In here, we talk in customers in the 1000s, in thousands range. So uh, how many thousand customers you have to, to, to move your product? And between wholesale, retail, food service, uh, reaching, uh, talking about Brazil, the size of the, 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 the geographic of the, the, the amount of, of lands we need to cover, the amount of mouths we need to, to fit here. Uh, so dealing with this, uh, this gigantic um, array of, of, of possibilities, uh, we, need, we need to establish an SNOP to at least uh, split the pie. So everybody needs to go after an amount of volume so we can guarantee that we are moving the, the plants, that the animals you are slaughtering, you are moving it with, as, as finished goods and you are allowing them to, to, to get inventory turns. Uh, by by itself, so that's that's one of the the, the main triggers of uh, setting uh, SNOP IBP cycles into those those big meat industries. Uh, in South America, there is a there is a, a unique a uniqueness around seasonality. That's where most of people are interested. We have barbecue season in in in, in summer, so we can see some some cuts with with specific seasonality shapes. Uh, we have holidays that that drives lots of of decisions of which cuts will be consumed more in, in each time of the year. And we work here as an export platform. So it's a, it, uh, the South America is a global uh, produ production platform. Uh, and this brings a, uh, a challenge. Certifications are on and off, depending on who is buying this, this, this product. In sometimes you are too too big in, in inventory. Sometimes you shut a certification just to 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 put your your inventory in a better shape. So that, that puts a, a gigantic challenge because you set all your footprint to address a couple of markets. Then you see one certification go down, and you need to reset the entire problem uh, again. You go you need to go from 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 uh, first step. So that's that. I think those are, are really unique things that that we have here, dealing with a massive number of customers, uh, dealing with seasonality, tropical area here, uh, and also with uh, working as a as a production platform for the the planet that brings lots of challenges to to the equation. I think those those would be the highlights from 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 what we see here, the the, the main pain points. So what do you think, Robbie? Anything different uh, on your side? Yeah, it, all of that definitely resonates and, and rings true when it comes to dairy. I think um, some things that perhaps are a bit unique about dairy is the um, way in which the ununiform supply interacts with the ununiform demand can possibly exaggerate market conditions quite a lot. And what I mean by that is, you know, typically Northern Hemisphere production um, in Europe will peak around about May and as we go into the winter that falls away. Um, New Zealand production peaks um, around you know September, uh, October time frame is at its trough um, May, June, July. So there's globally not a uniform amount of supply. If we then throw into the mix things like um, Christmas, Easter, um, Chinese New Year, Ramadan, etc., um, the Super Bowl for um, cheese consumption. All of these things, depending on when they fall, if they fall close together, if they're evenly spread apart, the way in which that demand comes through can really throw the markets in interesting ways. And if we find that we have multiple big demand event, uh, multiple big demand events coinciding. With each other say we have a situation where we have an early easter that coincides um uh, with ramadan would be an example we could see huge huge demand for fat but of course because it's disassembly when we make fat products be it our cheeses or our butters um we're going to have that protein left over. So particularly if we're, you know, if there's huge butter demand um, or AMF demand for confectionery, then that's going to result in a lot of non-fat dry milk or skim milk powder. How you manage that, how you balance that demand is crucial to how successful your business will be. We can't just view our demand for butter 
um, our demand for cheese in isolation. They need to be viewed as part of that whole composite stream, that whole product stream. Remember, you know, if I'm making butter, I think we've said this a few times, I'm making skim as well. So although the butter may be attractive, what and how much skim am I making and what am I going to do with that? Because if I don't understand that picture, if I can't marry the full demand side to the full supply side, I'm missing information, I'm making the wrong decisions. So we tend to see, you know, like I say, if you get a confluence of big demand events, they can really throw things out of sync. And then if you tie that with natural lows um, in the production cycle, just based on, you know, how and when supply comes in, that can make for some very, very interesting um, issues on the demand side as well. I think another thing um, that's quite interesting about dairy is for the most part, it's quite inelastic. People tend to think of dairy as a very base commodity, particularly milk. I don't want to say it doesn't matter what the price is, but generally speaking, fluid milk can go up and people won't shave demand until a point. So dairy demand is, I would say, very inelastic until it hits some critical point and then the demand just goes very, very quickly. And you just find it just happens for, it's not, oh, it hit $5 or it hit $4, it's some random number, but it was enough to push it over the end. And that I think is a real challenge as well, is how does that elasticity piece fit in to your production decisions? Um, and Dave, how does, that, how does that kind of link with what you say? Yeah, I was going to I was going to actually jump in there uh to say the same that we see the same thing in certain cuts, not all cuts uh, in the meat side in the US. I mean, um you get into, you know, certain cuts that are much more um inelastic. I mean, you know, think like uh, ground beef, for instance. It's it's going to be much less elastic in demand uh than say something like a pork uh, pork butt, you know, or pork tenderloin, which is not just the basis of so many different types of dishes that are ate here in the U.S. or or in North America. Um, so you see, you see a lot of that same thing, but then there's other cuts that are extremely price sensitive. Um, but some of the other things that I see around demand um, that are important um, here in is that. It's really important to think about the seasonality of demand and how you can flatten some of that out. Um, some of the, the best successes that I had in, in my time during, during the meat, in, in, while I was managing the meat industry was when I was trying to, to get rid of my worst sale. And this was always a big deal for me is get rid of your worst sale every day if you can, right? And, and oftentimes, you know, like you would go into, say, I remember early in my career, we, we were selling boneless picnics and we just weren't doing a very good job of it. And I just started noticing that certain sales to, you know, certain countries, and one was very particularly Japan, um, were, were very good and then others weren't. So what we started doing was just methodically trying to sell more boneless picnics into Japan. Now, everybody knows that. But until you do the analysis, you have the data. I mean, early in my career, we didn't even have good data. You know, you'd come in and basically you'd have a stack of paper on your desk that was telling you what your business was. It was really once we got good visualization of our sales history that we could start seeing these patterns. And, and that's also a big part of what we, you know, not a, it's not a huge part of what we do, but it's a part of what we do here is is look at those kinds of things and show you your sales history and where you have opportunities. And, you know, we'll, we'll bring in elasticity like you were talking about and, into pricing and, and forward demand. Um, and that, that's all very important. But once we started selling more of these bonus picnics into, um, into Japan and elsewhere in Asia, um, now this was like 20 years ago, but, but when we started doing that, I mean, our, our margins went through the roof. Another thing that we had a lot of success with, and this was much more recently, it was um, probably 
eight, 10 years ago at most, um, was when we started recognizing that if you could sell a bigger portion of your product frozen, um, particularly in certain cuts, it gave you a basis to where you did not have to negotiate below that number as long as you had certain amount of frozen product, right? And so bringing in more of that frozen demand helped our margins a ton. So, you know, thinking about that kind of optimization around demand planning and, you know, what sales you're going to take and particularly, you know, get rid of that worst sale every day if you can. And it's amazing how, you know, taking a sale that's, let's say, 10 cent negative margin and turning it into one cent margin or even negative 30 into one or, or even zero is transformative to your overall profitability within these commodity industries. It's, it's a very big deal. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of how I saw it. The, the last thing I really wanted to chat about, um, as, as we go through this is I wanted to talk a little bit about the optimization side of, of all of this, you know, how, how did you guys go about optimization within your industries? How would you do it today with, you know, with, with better tools, things like that. And, and really, you know, particularly um, thinking about the variability of supply and demand um, primarily between days and seasons. And then perishability is also a big deal in these commodity industries. It's, it's the one thing I didn't mention at the beginning um, around supply variability is this perishability is always the sort of Damocles that's hanging over our head, you know, as, as we're trying to get all this sold. It doesn't last forever. So, um, so we've got to deal with that. So how would you, how would you think about that, Robbie, in, in optimization around perishability and variability and, and demand planning and all of that kind of thing? In milk. Yeah, that's that's a great question. Um, that's, that's sort of at the core of you know where value can be added to the disassembly industry. Dairy, in particular, is a very low margin industry from a processor's uh, perspective. It involves massive upon massive amounts of working capital and invested capital. It generates phenomenal revenues in the billions, but the margins are very, very thin. It's a very expensive commodity. To kind of give you a sort of frame of reference here, one kilogram, which is you know a little, a uh, little over two pounds of um, skim milk powder, that could be three dollars, right? So let's call let's call a pound of of milk powder a buck fifty US. Um, conversely, one pound of sugar, I think is probably around, you know, depending where the market is, it could be around 11 or 12 cents. So it's a very expensive industry. I suspect meat is, um, is the same, um, partly because it's, it's pro, it's got a lot of protein in it, um, which is, you know, adds a lot of value, but because it's so expensive, you know, if we're talking about a company with a billion dollars revenue, 10 billion, 20 billion revenue, and these companies are out there, then if you can get just 1% more efficient in how you bring, you know, and how you optimize, and that, you know, generally speaking, that will translate all the way down the bottom line because your marginal costs should be marginal. You know, you've already paid for the milk at the farm end, you already have all your other OPEX costs accounted for that can lead to serious impact on your bottom line. So understanding that, you know, understanding how to actually optimize your network when you have such big fixed costs, such big material costs is super crucial. Um, you know, a new whole milk powder dryer, a new skim milk powder dryer, we're talking in the hundreds of millions, half billions for that. So filling your assets and optimizing what goes through them and what comes out is you can't run a successful business in the dairy industry without doing that and then like you said dave you've got the perishability element as well and that's something that is we probably don't talk enough about but it is super crucial and it's where when we're working with clients where we actually spend a lot of our time how how do you optimize your tanker network? How do you optimize your pickups, you know, your collections, your deliveries, 
and your processing. Keeping in mind, you know, you can only hold the raw material for so long, but also you can only hold the finished good for so long. Strictly speaking, you know, if you've got a good factory and you're making good quality skim milk powder with low microbe or, you know, everything is under control, everything is working as it should, that powder will be good if it's bagged and stored correctly. It'll be good for three years. But I can tell you, after three months, you know, it's not going to have the best buyers. And after six months, you're probably going to have to discount it to get rid of it or start chucking it into second tier markets. So understanding both the perishability of the raw input and, you know, the attractiveness um, of the output and how that factors into your decision making. You know, when am I going to make this product? Well, when am I going to sell this product? That should determine when I make it. The balance of when I'm going to sell all of my products, the balance of all of my demand should determine how I balance my supply against that. Having a system that can do that, you know, that is crucial and that that's where we spend a lot of our time on making sure that our clients are making the right products at the right times Celso, is that is that how you think about meat yep. yes i think i think you you brought this how, how to approach the, the optimization to to the problem we have multiple multiple uh, entry entry points here uh, we discussed it about supply, how variable it, it can be. If we apply some statistics to it, we will increase the the, the starting point from our from our plan, uh, and we can go like the, the the quality in the meat industry, the quality of animal you usually get from this farm. You can go a couple months uh, prior, you can go a couple years prior to track some seasonalities. So with basic statistics, you can start improving your process. Uh, dealing with optimization, more the end-to-end -end part of it, tracing what you're getting from your supply to the finished goods you you are you are achieving by by the end of the of each cycle. Uh, that by itself is is as complex as you can get. Sometimes you are optimizing your vacuum machines. Sometimes you are optimizing your frozen tunnels. Uh, the amount of products you you are getting there is is what you can get. So. You work at, at, at full at full strength, and sometimes you actually can optimize optimize your your carcass, your mix, uh, the, the mix of products you are getting out of each carcass. So depending on whatever uh, scenario you 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 are in, market from the market perspective, for from your internal perspective, assemble this puzzle is really hard. So uh, putting technology, putting analytics into it delivers a lot of value. Sometimes we just uh, showcase where your inventory is and customers from, from, from our portfolio are delighted about it because now I have visibility of what I have on hand. As simple as just having an extract of this is your inventory. So we did this to start our, our optimization process and for the, 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 the customer, it's, it's a, there's already value in it. And from my opinion, from, from past experiences dealing with optimization from the business side is having, having the ability to take faster decisions. Things will change. That is a given. Uh, it's, it's something we can't control. How we will react to those changes is what will dictate if a business is a successful one or not. So I think that's, that's mandatory. And to bo both your points, uh, we have a product that will expire. So we're having a ticking bomb in our, in our hands and we have to deal with it as fast as we can to deliver a product with quality to the, to the, to the final consumer. So by, by itself, the business need to be, we need to take decisions fast and plug these with all the complexity. We need to put science in it. Uh, if, if we don't, it's hard to say that you are planning well. That's something I, I carry from my past. We need to do a good plan. We probably don't do an awesome plan, the, the, the excellent top of the notch one. We need to plan well. We need to take uh, constructive decisions. And science helps, help, challenges us a lot, questions some of the decisions we have been taking in the past. And I think there is huge value in it. What can you plug in, Dave, around these? Yeah, you know, something you said right there at the end um, <clears throat> just just made me smile because 
you know, things are going to change. That's what you said. Right. And, and I didn't have a day in my career where things didn't, you know, blow up in my face somehow. <laughs> and, and, you know, particularly, uh, you know, as, as I was, when I was with farmland and then Smithfield, we had a lot of plants and we were doing a lot of hogs. And the more of that you get, um, you know, we, heck, I think at one point we had, you know, 12 different animal programs. So, you know, we were, we were making, you know, all of these, um, segregations in the, in the animal side and in the coolers. And then, you know, anything goes wrong and you've blown up your schedule. You've blown up your product left to sell, right? What you have left to sell, what I call PA. Um, and, and so managing those within day is a huge part of what we do with the software side, right? And so uh, a perfect example of this, Celso, is um, I had a, a, we had three plants on the East Coast and we had a, a, a hurricane come through and it was gonna wipe out two of them. And basically we, when we figured out that, okay, we're gonna shut these plants down for two or three days, whatever it was at the time, we spent, a whole day just figuring out what we had left to sell and what we had to short, you know, making, and that took, that took a, like hours and hours to do. And our salespeople the whole time are just freaking out because they don't know if they're going to fill their customers orders or not. That was, you know, we had a decent um, scheduling tool at that time, but I can tell you that uh, a scheduling tool like the one that we have here at Austin Data Labs, it would have done it in less than 30 minutes for eight different meat plants, you know, 120 something thousand head and all of the different customers demands, you know, because we would have been able to just change the number of animals coming in to zero, you know, on the days that we were shutting them down and, you know, maybe add that Saturday and then the system would recalculate what could be done from a production perspective and then tell you downstream what you still had left to sell or what you were short. All of that could have been done in less than an hour, probably closer to 30 minutes in a solution that was designed well to do it. But we ended up taking a whole day and then basically the next two days we were still dealing with it, you know, the, the blowback from it, right? Um, so that speed of change just, it killed us during that time frame. And that happened a lot, but that one was a pretty egregious one because we were shutting down two or three plants. Um, but making those finite changes, when you can make them quickly, we all know that the best sale you're gonna make of the day is at the, at the beginning of the day, you know, most of the time, like, you know, you're gonna get the best offers in the morning. And by the time you get to the afternoon, the sharks have swum, you know, are the only ones still swimming. And so the quicker you can make those changes, particularly when you're adding product, the better your sales is going to be on the backside. And, and uh, you know, uh, a little, little said thing is, is that the better your team chemistry is going to be. Nobody ever talks about that, but that's really important. You know, there's a whole book written on it called The Speed of Trust, right? You know, if your sales force and your scheduling team and your whole product management team, if they all trust each other because they're all working from the same playbook, they all have the same rules around optimization, you are going to have a much better outcome. And and you're also going to have a much better, you know, speed of trust, as that book said. But um, so other than that, um, that, that one just tickled my fancy when you said that, Celso. But, uh, you know, I, other than that, I would also want to talk about a, a little bit from, from the U.S. side. A big deal here is the optimization of downgrading higher value raw material into lower value. This happens a lot. And it's in most places that I come to, they don't really understand the cost. And, and so... You know, along with everything you guys said, I agree with all of it. It's pretty much relevant in, in the American meat business, too. I just wanted to talk about this secondary thing, which is if you are, say, uh, paying $20 a head more for, for an animal because it's organic or gap or whatever it is, and then you're only filling 20 to 30 percent, you know, taking 20 to 30 percent of that animal and selling it at that higher value um, finished good price, you know. 
and the rest of it, let's say 70% of that animal, the rest of it's being sold as commodity. You are almost never making money if you're doing that, or at least yeah. not making a lot more money. So having, um, th this is a big deal when you have all of these different animal classes or all of these different brands, optimizing that mix and getting your sales force to understand what they have left to sell in the, in the future for each different brand, for each different type of, of product is huge. And it, uh, it will take you from say 30% utilization, you know, of organic to, you know, to 80 or 90% over time. And you can get there pretty quickly as long as you are all again, working from the same playbook. You all know the same, you know, have the same product availability set in front of you. You all have the same inventory analyzer set in front of you. Everybody's working with the same numbers. And everyone has, it, it allows you to do things like have a plan, <laughs> right? To get more uh, because you're not just sitting here focusing all day on fighting the fire of what do I have left to sell or what am I going to schedule? So that's a big deal from an optimization perspective in my mind as well to go on top of all of those others. So uh, unless, does he, do either of you guys have a rebuttal or anything you want to say or are we getting close to the end here? We can no, go think, hours um, and hours on this topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we could. <laughs> yeah, to the user, you know, to, to the folks viewing this, the, this is the kind of thing that the three of us could geek out on for. Just like Celso said, for hours, we, we, we do it. So <laughs> it's a good time. Anything from you, Robbie? No, just it, it, all, it all rings true. Um, you know, having full visibility of what, what's coming in, what you're doing with it, where it's going, all of the in-between is just crucial. And without that, you're flying blind. Yeah, I, I went from zero visibility at the beginning of my career to, you know, much more visibility toward the end. And I can tell you for a fact, it, it's transformational. So I totally agree, Robbie. Thanks, everyone, for showing up um, and, and, and watching this. Hopefully you got something out of it and we'll catch you later.